Okay, next up we have James Lee and Jakub Spacek talking about the Remesh Confluence. Welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for being here. And thanks, SideFX, for having us. It's a big opportunity for us. And uh, this right here is James Lee. And this is Jakub Spacek. And together we are the Remesh. And it's really just about experimenting and cooperating together in uh, any capacity that we find time about. So we've met each other in Future Deluxe roughly five years ago and started working from a variety of commercial projects, some personal, personal projects. We always try to find time to <clears throat> not only full time, but also outside of the work, have some sort of passion projects of our own that we would experiment with. I think when we met at Future Lux, we realized we had a similar uh, liking to the abstract simulation stuff. And three years ago, I got into Unreal and we thought, oh, let's try bringing some of the Houdini stuff into Unreal and try other things. Oh my God, to Jakob, oh, like, try a Venom simulation, or try this, and we would try, like, VR or something with Unreal 5. And the first project we will share with you is Project Neil. Um, roughly a year ago, I was approached by a company called Artpoint, and um, it was a commission work from a, <laughs> funnily enough, cheese manufacturer, and they just wanted like a four abstract animations that would, in a very abstract way, represent some microbi microbiology or like senses that come within the cheese making process. So we had about two, and a f two to three weeks to do this, and we thought, oh, on the back of all those real projects, let's try and do it on the commercial project. Um, we, I think we only had one GPU to render, and uh, we had to do four 4K animations that were 30 to 60 second loops, so let's, which, well, let's, let's just try it. And we uh, were given this sort of basic color theme, and we decided to separate the animations into landscape and portraits, so we can utilize the simulations that we will be experimenting with in different ways. Here's a little example uh, how it was presented an exhibition in New York afterwards, the client was happy, so we were sort of satisfied with how everything turned, turned around. So here's the beginning of our R&D and our process. So all the playbacks we did in the, the traditional like Houdini way, but we thought every still and every render, we want to do it outside of Unreal 5, just so that we get more familiar with doing this workflow versus, let's say, look deving in Redshift and then having to replicate the look. So everything there on is like this. And one of the things that we experimenting with before uh, in one of our projects was utilizing textures, uh, specifically in displacement maps, uh, which gives you the ability to you know, enable your geometry or simulation with way more detail. Uh, so first thing that we wanted to really explore was like, how can we achieve some, something similar within Unreal Engine? So because in, in the real, you can't really do displacement in the same way like you might do in the Redshift uh, shader. We would just bring the, this task model into ZBrush Sculpt in detail, and then do some Vellum and different types of sim tests to just see if this would come in in the real and we could have that. And at the very beginning, we weren't exactly sure what language, visual language we, got, we, we want to explore. And we decided to sort of mix RBD, Vellum simulations, and flip simulations to just sort of find different languages and visual representation of some background idea. And here you can see some of the initial exploration, some, you know, rigid body transforming into Vellum. James was experimenting a lot in uh, Unreal with materials, and it was a really fun process to see um, also responsibly, how, how quickly we can get some things done. So somewhere along the lines of the process, Jakob thought, oh, let's add an environment. Let's use Nanite, which is like the technology in the real that allows you to use a lot of geometry. Because initially, we're just going to do close-up macro kind of abstract simulation animations. So to the left is some of the early designs and explorations of what we were thinking to do for the environment. And down the line, this is one of the first one called Airy, and we were just trying to represent this sort of airflow within some sort of a miniature scale environment. One of the things that we always tried to focus on was taking a piece or slice of the environment and creating the simulations on, on that and then bringing it and merging it back with the overarching, you know, large scale uh, geometry. Uh, on the right, you can see the final animation. 
And one of the things that we were tasked to always do is find some way to loop it. So here you can see an example how James found a way to sort of regrow the elements that are being peeled away uh, to get the sense of looping animation. Uh, in another one, Crumbly, we were just experimenting with some RBD uh, fracturing simulations, very basic setups to just get a sense of what we can achieve and bring into Unreal. So just a little bit more R&D, and in the bottom right, you can see we're still experimenting with that abstract T form of an environment, but in the end, we went with this staircase formed environment just because the form of it lent better to the type of simulation we wanted and how the pieces would break away. And uh, in initial phase, we are bringing everything into Unreal uh, thanks to Alembic, which is definitely a good way to do it. Uh, it serves its purpose. But because I was iterating with many different sort of iterations of the simulations, finding the right sort of motion or how fast the pieces would crumble apart, we started utilizing FBX because it allows you to bring in only the point animation of individual pieces. So if I would uh, prefracture the geometry, keep the same amount of pieces, I could easily do many variations and just give James a small file which would have the point position and he could just update the pieces in Unreal. So here's some of the R&D we did for the liquid type of uh, liquid animation. Jakob was really curious whether we could replicate some of the things he's done in the past with the deforming UVs, deforming attributes. And we managed to find a way how we could like bring some of his old projects out of Houdini, export it as a Lembic, and that would carry all of that information and we could render that in, in Unreal. Here's a little example of James's exploration, creating this sort of like a 3D printer liquid animation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always about just having fun and exploring what essentially works or what doesn't. Yeah, I think it's always important to just try things, like to just do different types of tests and not really care if it fails or not, or it's not the right thing. It's the only way to try and like discover new, new uh, things and you can also apply them to tests down the line. So here is the resulting fluid simulation that we decided to use. And one of the things that we wanted to utilize in Unreal was uh, blending different materials. So traditionally in Houdini, you can work with attributes, you know, directly feed them into render and have the result that you want. And in order to do it in Unreal, you need to uh, use call attribute and promote it on the vertex so Unreal can read it uh, and work with it in the same way. So on the right is the final simulation. And again, we were creating some sort of fake looping that we would just uh, offset the camera so we could start over. In the last one, which was like soft, we were exploring these pleasing motions uh, utilizing vellum simulation. And James did a variety of different uh, experiments utilizing different constraints, deformations within vellum and to find a final uh, sort of motion that we wanted to translate. And I think the one that we liked was this kind of forming hard metal bending kind of animation. And in the bottom right, we have the final animation, but not the final render. And the thing that we found on this project was we would isolate the specific parts of where the simulation was happening, because that way it would decrease the file size that was coming out of um, Houdini. You wouldn't have to export as much geometry, and uh, the import time into Unreal would be lower. But because of that, we ended up getting these seams around where the simulation was happening, but we managed to solve that. So here's the final animation. As you can see, it seamlessly blended into the environment that uh, that sort of block that was simulated on. And again, we utilized the uh, you know different materials blending together with the color attribute, um, which was also across all the four realms. Was uh, we were utilizing this technique, and the looping is happening by tiling the environment again. So this is just a look of what it's like when it's in Unreal. And as you can see, once I've received some simulations from Jakob or the ones I've imported. We have like complete uh, fluidity and feedback from just scrubbing around in, that, in scrubbing the animation. And I think the nice thing about this is that we can see the simulation in full context with lighting, with the materials, and if we're making any changes to the lighting and materials, it's just instant. And I can talk to Jakob and say, what do you think about this or that? And we can just make those changes together. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I, I work with simulations in Houdini, and even if you cache them out, um, a lot of the times you don't get a, like a 
real-time preview on your timeline. So seeing this, uh, you know, being able to do this in Unreal was really like, for me, it was, wow, this is super cool. And, and the responsiveness is really amazing. So the next project we'll uh, share with you is a project Solid. It's focused on RBD and fracturing, and we really wanted to test our sort of skill and creative capability, how to deal with this Houdini Unreal workflow uh, with something a little bit more sophisticated. So we had two weeks to do this, and um, we just wanted to try something that was not going to be polished, just give us a chance to uh, fail and try different things, find the technical challenges that we were interested in, and uh, have fun by learning. Yeah. and. Uh, we didn't have time to, you know, collaborate with any sound designer or do some custom sign. So uh, let's take a minute of silence for uh, someone important. Cool. So we just can talk about the process of what we learned during this, this project. So in the beginning, um, I had received a Rococo suit two weeks before, and we just wanted to explore the motion of like what maybe this character is doing. So this is Rococo Studio where we're recording it, and we're just exploring different types of movements and trying to find what we liked for the character. And then we were doing Google Meets quite often, so this is how me and Jakob were communicating and I'm in the suit and um, I'm doing like this lovely performance of this rock guy. And I think one of the interesting things we found personally, like we're normally like working with mocap and bringing that into Houdini and then working with that animation data, then doing the simulation. But during the time where, let's say, I pass the data to Jakob, he might discover, oh, when you move an elbow like this, the chunks are coming off like that. So you should do more of that kind of movement. Or maybe your knees, you should like do heavy leg movements and we found a way that like we were passing the mocap to Houdini and backwards and back and forth. And this was kind of an interesting process for us. And uh, uh, at, the, at the bottom, you can see me talking. And one of the things, we, we were doing a lot of takes and uh, variations in, in the mocap. And some time ago, I saw some documentary about like directors or whatever. And I created this little script of what would be happening in the sort of storyline and what we want to achieve during the time that we want to be you know, certain, uh, let's say, minute or two. So I would be just telling James uh, what comes next, what he should do, and he could just focus on, like, the performance and how to do the motion and stuff. I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, what, what should he do next or how long he should stay in that position. So it was really fun. Um, and one of the things, when James got the suit, he was like, oh, Jacob, come on to Google Meet. Like, we got to talk, it's an emergency. And I was just joining Google Meet, and uh, <laughs> he was there in a meta-human form. So... It, it's fun to see like the motion capture capabilities of Unreal as well, and we'll definitely try to do something in the future with that. So once we got a version of the mocap that we were relatively happy in the beginning, we'll bring it into Unreal and then just start blocking out some of the ideas, like how we might shoot it, what kind of environment we might have. That's an early idea of what type of environment we ended up scrapping it. And it's just nice to kind of see and kind of spin off what we see here. And then we had some other ideas that we unfortunately didn't implement, but before, oh, because we got the hand capture, we could do some things like maybe the character's holding like a bunch of stones or playing, you know, playing them from them around or something like this. Or perhaps he's like bashing for some uh, like blocks and things like this, but unfortunately we couldn't implement everything just because of the time constraints. So uh, in the early time of the R&D, we had this idea of a pre-fractured, pre-designed character that would respond to the performance from the motion capture. 
but I always wanted to, you know, for a long time I wanted to test out the guide uh, principle that's that has been sort of introduced with the SOP level rigid body solver. So I started experimenting with that. And here's a little example of like simplified connection, how you connect some sort of deformed fractured pieces into your bullet solver on a sub level. And the results I was getting was, was really fun. It was interesting. I had relatively enough controls, but I wasn't really understanding like what's happening under the hood and, and how I could sort of work with it more in depth. So I was curious and started experimenting how to recreate this uh, on a dope level, not on soap, but inside a uh, dope level. And uh, it took me a while, as you can see, to figure out like how things work, where the plug, what nodes to use. Um, there are some resources on it online. But eventually I got to a stage where the principle of guiding uh, fractured pieces with the guide deformed geometry was working. I had relatively good amount of controls. And that was the point where we were discussing how abstract we should go with the character and how the volume and mass uh, of the body mass would sort of react to the performance. But because we had limited time, we decided to stick with relatively humanoid form that, that would give us the geometry that would respond well with the motion capture. So at this stage, we had sort of things working the way we wanted and we wanted to, we could like focus on exploring it further. So as we were designing and updating the uh, geometry of the character, we all know that in uh, rigid bodies we can use constraints which are like essential part of having a lot of our direction. And one of the uh, techniques that is really cool to utilize uh, is switching the constraint type on a simulation level. So here in a RBD material fracture, there's a pre-prepared settings where you can just enable switch constraints uh, on the simulation level. Here in this example, it didn't really work the way I want, but it sort of gives you understanding that you can utilize it in ways that maybe you wouldn't think or, uh, think otherwise. These settings can be accessed on a sub level with the RBD constraint properties as well, and then you can feed it uh, either into sub level rigid body solver or like double level uh, rigid body solver as well. And here I sort of experimented with it, and I had a little bit more understanding how to control it during the simulation. So we had this stage where I could either let the character be fully driven by the guide setup and, and guided geometry, or I could like break constraints and break it apart during the simulation. And at some point we started discussing that we would really want the character to be glued into the environment or some ground. So uh, we decided to sort of experiment with that and eventually ended up uh, constraining also the hands and other feet, which uh, proved to be challenging uh, with regards to the mocap a little bit, and we'll talk about it uh, in the next stage. So I'll just guide you through the Houdini setup and how everything came together. So we knew we would need would sculpt on top of the initial position of the mocap. So once we decided which take we liked, we found like a smooth basic mesh, and then we would bring that to Z version and then sculpt on top of that. But because it wasn't rigged, we just did a bone capture, basic bone capture to rig the character and then have it deform with the mocap. And this was good enough for the guide sim. However, one of the things that we kind of like explored and discovered was like issues that are coming from the mocap. So um, even though James's hands were like fully constrained in the real world space, yeah, the motion capture had some jittering, some transformations were happening, even though they should have been static. So we utilized Kinefix nodes to kind of constrain the hand and feet, uh, and then we could uh, sort of release them based on either frame or distance or you know velocity from the original geometry. Uh, to create an environment, because we didn't have you know much time during the iteration, so we needed something that would be responsive to the changes in the mocap. So as we were iterating. I was just doing this basic environment that was like bounding box, slightly deformed, and it would give us a uh, easily maintainable sort of uh, structure. Um, then one of the things that's important is like finding the right you know, uh, poly count for your fracturing. Uh, you can fracture a high dense mesh in Houdini, but if you have any sort of intersecting, intersecting you will get a lot of problems uh, if you want to have like a high resolution. Pieces. And that's why 
we decided even this whole Houdini Unreal for this particular reason. In a prefactor stage, we just created a character in a more volumetric um, sort of size to give us these pockets that would serve to uh, anchoring the character into the environment so we wouldn't have to fracture and simulate the whole environment. And for the fracturing itself, we utilize impact points. Uh, it's super simple and straightforward. It gives you the control to decide where will be more fractures on the character. So here we know it's a humanoid and it will have joints that will be bending. We needed more definition in those areas to get this uh, work properly. Here's a little representation of the fracturing. You can see the small pieces are in the areas of the joint. And before we bring all of this into the simulation, we needed to initialize active and inactive areas. So the, area, the, the pockets and areas that would sort of be merged with the environment shouldn't really react or deform. And one of the things that we needed was to get rid of the constraints that would otherwise maybe affect the uh, simulation in a way that we didn't want. Here is an example how the guided fractured pieces are moving before you bring it into the simulation. And here's a comparison what's happening if you run it in the simulation. Now, I mentioned before the switching the constraints during the simulation level. So here is an example how glue constraints, uh, when they are broken, they initialize into soft constraints. You can then break those constraints further, uh, but if you keep them, you can use them to maybe uh, add direct the character more. You have dampness, stiffness, you know, rest length, and all these things to play around with so the pieces maybe stay together in a way that you want. Cool. So once we've got the simulations in the place, Let's talk about how we brought it to Unreal and some other post uh, fracture and simulation processes we did in Houdini. So we knew we were just going to have one simulation for the whole thing and then we would just shoot it at different angles like you would do with live action. So given that we could use Nanite, we thought, oh, let's just up res the mesh that we would fracture it. And uh, that should cover us in all angles. But also, like, we needed to make sure that the texture resolution was good enough for, for the, the close-ups as well. So we spread the UVs across UDIMs, 10 UDIMs, and then when we brought it into Substance, um, we would just have a specific mesh that didn't have any of the interior fractures and bake all the ZBrush, high detail ZBrush details back onto that sculpt. And uh, the, in Substance, the, the texture setup was procedural. So if Jakob wanted to change his fractures or change his simulations, I'll just re we UV it and then bring it back in the substance and we'll get the same look again. And that way we're not blocking each other. Like uh, he doesn't have to wait for me in one place and he can carry on his thing and it's the same for me. And um, this was just some early look dev of comparing what we're getting in substance on the left and what we're getting in, in Unreal on the right. And we just wanted to make sure that the textures in substance were kind of matching up. And for the most part, I would say it's like 90% there. We did have a little bit of issue with the color space where when we were bringing it from Substance to Unreal, it was coming in a little bit contrasty, and I think that was to do with the color space. So we managed to fix that, and that was, that was cool. So because Jakob was working with like a low-res um, model to help him like speed up his fracturing process and his simulation process, he would work with that, and we decided, oh, we'll do all the displacement after that just so that it doesn't slow him down that end, and we can be fast in that way, and we, I can carry on doing my stuff. So here we just have a simple process to apply the displacement post-fracture on the outer, outer shell of the character, and simply just a up-res version of his mesh and the, the Zebrish sculpt, and we just point deform it. And we did a similar thing for the interior fractures where you could up res the outer shell and the inner fractures separately. So we didn't have a lot, initially we weren't sure about if we were going to add this or not, but we had a little bit of time to just develop this. So the cool thing is like we can independently say, oh, maybe we should just pay more attention to the, the detail on the outside and focus on that. And then all the in interior fractures will just be low res. But the uh, displacement near the edges, uh, we can control how far that's going so that it wouldn't affect the edge fractures and cause any intersecting issues. So, as I said before, like we tried Olympics and F, uh, FBX with the RBD fracturing stuff in the last project in Sydney, 
but we knew like we won't be able to do that with this project or we'll be able to try that if we did that. If we use Alembic, the file size would be massive because of the amount of geometry you want to try. And uh, the same reason would happen with the FPXs. And the thing is, we would also get like shadow problems with Lumen. So when we import um, Jakob's low res FPX simulation into, um, it all looks like, uh, looks like the thing to the left. And all we really want from this is not the animation itself, but the skeletons which have the bones. And the bone, on the bones, they have the point information and rotation attributes and the name attributes. And these are the three things we need for when we bring in the high res fractured pieces. So when we import those high res fractured pieces, like you saw before, it would take something like, I don't know, like between one to 10 minutes to import. And that would depend on the resolution of the pieces and how many pieces we, ha uh, we would have in fractures. So that in itself wasn't too, uh, too heavy as a process. And in Unreal, we would then use this blueprint that I created to match the nanite pieces to that low res FBX uh, of Jakob's fracture. And the way it's doing this is getting, it goes through all the high res fracture pieces, gets the name of them, matches it to the name of the right bone, and that way it will be correct. And if it looks right, it should be like this. So on the left is like the same uh, FBX skeletal animation that you've seen, and on the right is what we used in the final project with the high res nanite meshes matching the correct animation. If it mismatches, it comes a bit, of a bit of chaos and it's all over the place like this. And there's times where we're like, oh, maybe this isn't going to work, but we managed to fix it. So to, just to add a little bit um, more information why we wanted to do it this way, even though we only had one character, if we had like multiple characters and we just imported it like the FBX way or Alembic where it's just a normal mesh, eventually your frame rates or your performance in Unreal is going to go down. So that way you don't get the benefits of having an interactive real-time workflow. And also like you see that there'll be memory issues in Unreal as well. So then it's just like kind of pointless. So we thought just to future-proof what we want to do in the future, we just go this way, try and figure all these things out and um, solve that. So once that, all that's done, we can have fun. So I can bring in Jakob's simulations, put all the high-res high -res mesh, and we can start to do like camera tests and try and figure out what camera language we want to do, do lighting tests. And just to um, show that like, we went through so many iterations, like on the top left is like an early version of the animation, and I could just say to Jakob, oh, what do you think of this light? What do you think of that light? We could change it. Or should we have like glowing in the materials? Or should we not? Should we have the space? Or should we not? And it was just really cool that we could have the speed and iteration to, to move forward with the project. And to just give a bit of context when it's rendering, this is the whole animation that we had before. And I'm just rendering it maybe, I think, at 720 or something. But it's rendering it all in pretty much two minutes. And I could send him the MP4, and he could be like, oh, OK, maybe we should change that and change that. Yeah, and one of the reasons. Like working in Houdini, let's say you have 3,000 or 4,000 frames, which would give you a few minutes of animation. If I was spitting out the play blast at one frame per second, it would still take me like 30, 40 minutes to get out a preview. So this way, James would just turn it back in a few minutes and we would have the whole uh, sequence uh, to preview. So it was really uh, yeah, changing for like the workflow as well. And the cool thing is like, if I didn't want to like send him MP4, and we're just on a Google Meet. I could just screen share my screen and be like, yo, Jakob, what do you think of this lighting? And he'd be like, oh, I just move the light there, move that. And it just feels like he's more involved in the process, given that we were working remotely. And it felt a little bit more of like a student, um, studio vibes in that sense. Definitely. I, I think that now we develop this sort of like a standard that we just keep the Google Meet running uh, the whole day. You can come out and in any time you want. And if you're working and you just want to brainstorm, you just ask, hey, what do you think of this and that? And also working remotely, both of us as freelance, it kind of gets, you know, shitty at times. So you are always engaging with someone and you have this sense of virtual studio, like sitting next to the person uh, at a desk. And again, just some more context. Like we could just scrub through the whole thing and I could ask him about, oh, should we just change some shots and this sort of stuff? And it's just really nice to have this speed and flexibility with, when working with a sim or animation. 
But the final thing, just want to add regarding how we use Houdini inside of um, Unreal, like we had a HDA, which is a Houdini digital asset where you can kind of build a setup and then bring it into Unreal. And we had these like concrete fractured uh, meshes, which we uh, just used to quickly set dress the environment as we didn't have a lot of time to uh, set dress the environment. And we would have a few different iterations of those blocks and you can directly in, in Unreal, you can just change some some settings and you get from variations. Well, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, shoot. We'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Super cool. Any questions? Yeah. This is a super, super newbie question because I used Udini like twice in my life. Why didn't you just use Udini Engine inside Unreal? I don't know if it's supported for Unreal Engine 5. Like, why did you export FBX and uh, Alembic? Because you can't have a simulation or animation coming out of Udini Engine. It's more like to generate stuff, like models or kind of thing. Ah, um, oh, I, I didn't know about it. Thank you. But you can use Engine with, uh, with Unreal 5, but only for those purposes, yeah. Other questions? Long one, scope, yeah. Two, Two questions. Um, you talked about that you used Alembics uh, to export the uh, fracturing. Um, have you thought of vertex animation textures to do that? Yeah, we, we've done that in the past, but the, the limit is when you use like how big the, the texture is and the, yeah. the shader set up in the reels a bit, bit fiddly. Mm -hmm. So even if you had like a big liquid simulation, it's still easier just to export as a lambic, and that's more like your traditional export. Who do you need to bring it into mm -hmm. Maya Cinema kind of thing? And that kind of works. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a little curious about the uh, your concerns about the alembic size. So we, I haven't imported alembics into Unreal yet, but in other packages, the big alembic is big, but then it kind of runs pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, like the refresh uh, refresh rate is pretty good. So yeah. I'm assuming that's uh, not the story with Unreal. Uh, takes long to import, or you can import it, you can work with it. Um, but the only problem is if you're working with Lumen then it starts to stagger because Lumen's not designed to work with like high resolution, like normal geometry, it needs to be nanite. So when you have the mesh in nanite, you can go absolutely crazy. And you can have like 30 million polygons per character or whatever you want. Oh, and, for okay. that, so, sorry. and for that reason, we decided to do it that way. So you needed some form of stable geometry, yeah? So that uh, non-deformed geometry so that nanite works? Is that what you're saying? Because the alembic, full alembic would be a deformed geometry or? Yeah, if it was for the liquid stuff, we would have to figure out a different way because deforming geometry with nanite would probably, um, I don't think you can do that at this point. That's too like static. Anyone else? All right, well, thanks, uh, Jakob and James. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.